I am so excited to have David Sirota on the podcast today. If you haven't heard of him, David Sirota has this long and storied career that encompasses politics and media and Hollywood. He started his career working with Bernie Sanders. He wrote his speeches, uh, was major in the Bernie Sanders campaign before he went on to do the Meltdown podcast on Amazon about the 2008 financial crisis. He was a writer on the film Don't Look Up on Netflix, which is fantastic. Discovered a very large comet. Oh, good for you. It's headed directly towards Earth. He's the founder of the Lever News site, which talks about politics. And I, I think the, the, the phrase, the lever there, is to use the media as a leverage to create political change. But the reason why he's here today is because of his brand new podcast, Master Plan. And I gotta say, I love it. Like, I've been binging this thing on my bike rides. And the thing that impressed me the most about Master Plan is that David has captured the essence of an American problem one that transcends either political party. The show connects the earliest inklings of organized corruption at the very top echelons of power through the Citizens United ruling all the way to this incredibly scary Republican manifesto known as Project 2025 today. But lest we be accused of partisanship, let's start by shining a light on the Democratic Party for a second. So David, last month you attended the Democratic National Convention, and one of the most shocking updates that I saw on your social media was that right out in front of everything was this literal sign saying that the tobacco company Philip Morris was listed as a sponsor. What dystopian situation led the Democrats to saying the quiet part out loud? Well, I mean, look, the, the modern Democratic Party likes to to portray itself as a party of, of, of the working class. Uh, and I think that's not untrue, but it's also to say that the Democratic Party uh, also is the party of, for lack of a better term, the ruling class or, or the donor class. And I should say that's the same thing for the Republican Party. So I guess what I'm, I'm getting at is, is that the branding of the party is in tension with what the party actually is. And when you walk around the convention and you see all of the images of corporate sponsorship, uh, it's kind of an admission that the brand of the party is in tension with who the stakeholders in the party actually are. Uh, and I think that's an outgrowth of the master plan story that we report in our podcast series, that we are living in the era of huge money politics I mean, some people liken it to the Gilded Age, uh, the Gilded Age, you know, 100, uh, 120 years ago with robber barons and the like. Uh, and, and I think that's, in, in a sense, an understatement. I think we're living in an era where uh, money controls both parties, controls politics. Money really is politics in a way where it's uh, there's no pretense about it, really. Uh, right. When if, if you're at a party convention and the party conventions events are sponsored by uh, you know, Reynolds Tobacco, uh, Philip Morris, uh, uh, the natural gas, fossil fuel industry, et cetera, et cetera. It's an open, I mean, they, they're not trying to hide it, right? They're openly proud of who is sponsoring the convention. And, you know, if n nobody really believes in their heart that the fossil fuel industry or the tobacco industry or any of the other industries that sponsored either party's convention, nobody believes that those. Uh, sp those corporate interests are sponsoring the conventions uh, out of the goodness of their own heart or out of any sense of altruism. They are doing that as an investment, and they're mm -hmm. expecting a return on their investment in the form of government favors up and down uh, the all levels of government. That's why they make uh, the investment. It's not a donation. I think almost donation is like a misnomer, right? These are sponsorships. These are investments. And, and, you know, that's the fascinating thing about investigative journalism is that sometimes you get the idea and, and we do do this, right? We do find hidden documents and 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 reports that, that have never come to the surface. But the fascinating thing about this job is that so often it's just right there. It's just perfectly obvious and right in front of you and even like branded right on people's shirts, you know, um, you know, and and. and 
let me get, and I actually want to go into that branding on shirts a little bit later because there's this moment in the podcast that is just jaw dropping with where Philip Morris's name actually shows up. But, but that's going to be an Easter egg, you know, for those people who will, will stay around for the next 15 minutes. You start the podcast out in the 1970s during the Nixon administration, where you're tracing the, the roots of corruption all the way back there with a very specific story about the milk industry lobbying Nixon for special favors. Why begin there and not looking at Graft going all the way back to, I don't know, the nation's founding? Well, I, we're going to have a bonus episode looking at uh, all that led up to where we start the podcast, all the corruption that led up to that. Uh, I, I I think we start in the 70s because the early 70s was the point where there was the first real campaign finance reforms and anti-corruption efforts in the modern era. I mean, for 50 years before the early 1970s, there were very weak anti-corruption laws on the books. And, and the major one, as it related to Congress, this is a, we found a document showing this, the major one was only officially enforced if Congress referred cases to the Justice Department. In other words, Congress would have to rat itself out mm -hmm. in order for the police, essentially, uh, and the prosecutors to enforce this weak anti-corruption law. That was an official policy started in the Eisenhower administration mm -hmm. uh, during in their Justice Department. So the 70s, we start there because that's the first moment where the political system seems to be saying, okay, we have to do something about corruption. And we start with this dairy scandal because it was a, a an emblematic moment in this era, an era, by the way, we should mention, of major reforms. I mean, this is the era of, of Medicare, Medicaid, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the creation of the EPA, the creation of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, et cetera, et cetera. So the government was more small d democratically responsive mm -hmm. uh, than probably it's ever been in our modern history. Uh, and this scandal contributed uh, to a push for uh, the government to deal with the corruption problem underneath everything else. And what, what the scandal really was, was Nixon was caught on tape uh, discussing with his treasury secretary and his staff, shaking down, those are Nixon's words, shaking down the dairy industry for more uh, campaign cash to Nixon in exchange for a government agriculture department policy uh, to raise the price of milk, a.k.a. to enrich the milk producers. Uh, it the headlines... and it, was ama it was amazing to hear that audio in your show of Nixon <laughs> just being just straight up saying, yeah, we're shaking him down for more money. And you're like, oh, my God. Right. It, it's it's an it's incredible audio. I mean, you got to hear it to, to believe it. You know what? We're going to go to a clip of that right now. And Nixon says that in exchange for that big favor, Connolly is going to squeeze the dairy companies for even more cash than what they were already funneling to Nixon's political machine. <laughs> Did you hear that? Listen to it again. And he's just it down. Yes, he's literally talking about, quote, shaking them down. And I should mention, the tapes didn't come out until Watergate a few years later, but the story about, hey, Nixon's raising the, you know, the dairy price supports and getting a lot of campaign cash. He's reversing his old policy and also getting a lot of campaign cash. It contributed to the push for the first campaign finance reform laws. Now, it's worth it's worth mentioning soon after that. Nixon has to sign those laws, has to basically pretend like he wants to clean up corruption. And then almost almost immediately after signing those laws, his administration is hard at work undermining the law mm -hmm. that he just signed. We found a memo in which uh, G. Gordon Liddy and John Dean are planning their ways to uh, accept campaign cash, undisclosed campaign cash. Uh, bags of cash, really, I mean, literally suitcases of cash uh, that were being poured into Nixon's campaign anonymously after this campaign finance reform law passed. Uh, and that money ultimately was found to be illegal, uh, uh, undisclosed. Uh, major corporations were prosecuted for this because that money was not only illegal donations, it ended up funding the Watergate break-in. Uh, and so 
out of Watergate came more reforms uh, under the under the uh, veneer of uh, an anti-corruption uh, crackdown. But even that law after Watergate, uh, even that law was there was loopholes added to it to allow for the creation and explosion of corporate PACs. And the question is, well, how did those loopholes get in? How did Watergate not even fully catalyze uh, a real uh, anti-corruption uh, movement that stuck? And the answer is, is because there was a guy named Lewis Powell. Uh, no, Lewis- oh, oh, we're we're going to get to Lewis Great. Powell. Great. Because Lewis Powell is is so important to this. But let, let's, before we get into those nitty gritty details, I want to ask like a really, really big question, which is just right at the heart of everything that you're doing, which is let's define what corruption yeah. is in mm-hmm. the first place. And, and, and I, and not only that, but how corruption has changed over time. It's a great question. Um, it, it, look, every, every government, every society in human history is going to have corruption. And by corruption, what we mean is decisions that are supposed to be made in the public interest uh, that are and made for uh, to benefit private interests. Uh, that's corrupting the democratic process. Democracy is supposed to be uh, one person, one vote. People elect representatives uh, to uh, represent their interests, the broad public's interests. And the way you corrupt that formula is um, to use money to get the people's representatives to represent only a small handful of donors and oligarchs. That corrupts democracy. Um, so as I said, in the early 70s, the you know, nothing's perfect and there's always gonna be some level of corruption. Uh, you know, some government officials skimming off the top, et cetera, et cetera. That's always gonna be there. But in the 1970s, the democracy was fairly functional, right? I mean, it wasn't perfect, but people were mad and the government was responding, uh, again, with Medicare, Medicaid, EPA, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the government was democratically responding. And I think clearly corporate interests and oligarchs didn't like that because the government was responding uh, with policies uh, that were limiting corporations and oligarchs' power to uh, enrich themselves. And so the corporations and oligarchs knew they had a problem with democracy. They knew that corruption, as I've just defined it, is the way for them to uh, to protect themselves, to short circuit that one person, one vote paradigm uh, in order to continue hoarding wealth and power. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, um, wasn't it, it like it was... When I think of corruption, I think that there's like laws involved, right? Like, like, did we have laws at one point that define corruptions one way and have they changed? Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, the, 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 the weak laws that were on the books before the 1970s, what we're talking about is like, you, you can't literally give a bag of cash to a politician in exchange for a favor. Although now, now you actually can, and we can talk about <laughs> The Supreme Court, <laughs> the Supreme, the recent Supreme Court rulings, but the the, the basic idea was y- y- straight up bribery was technically illegal. What we're talking about in Master Plan is all the ways that all for- lots of forms of corruption were essentially legalized, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's not just corruption; isn't just I'm going to give you a bag of cash, you're going to do a government favor. Um, corruption is if you, the senator, votes this way, or <clears throat> if you, the congressman, puts an amendment into a bill, we, the industry, or we, the billion, uh, this handful of billionaires, are going to spend $50 million mm-hmm. on your behalf in your reelection campaign. Technically, the senator or congressman did not get personally enriched by that, mm-hmm. but they did get to keep their job. They do get mm-hmm. to keep their power because presumably th- that money that's poured into the election is going to allow f- for that politician's message to be communicated uh, at, at far higher amplification uh, mm-hmm. uh, among voters. Uh, so it's going to be more likely that that politician is going to get reelected. In a, in a sense, that is a quid pro quo, even if it's unstated. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And so that's the kind of corruption, as one example, that was legalized. That was mm-hmm. that was made like I think that's the thing. Sometimes people get get uh, twisted up about, it, which is corruption doesn't mean it's illegal. Mm-hmm. You know, if you yeah. have a if you have a problem, you know, on the corporate side, if you if you don't like that some form of corruption is illegal, you have two choices. You can stop doing the act because it's illegal or you can make it legal. And mm-hmm. that's what we're, what the master plan really did. It was to make many forms of soft corruption and systematic corruption mm-hmm. legal, enshrine uh, legal doctrines that say this is OK to do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's I, I mean, that is the message of this podcast where we see how. Um, you know, just big power says like, look, if we want to control the system, we have now uh, avenues to do it. And it just seems like it's getting to absurd levels now. And, you know, it, you trace this all back to this document, right? In episodes three and four, uh, you dive into this obscure, what what is an obscure document because it's not written about a lot until sort of more recently about a justice named Lewis Powell who's a Supreme Court justice who wrote the Powell memo. And I want you to tell me what that is and and what we need to know about it. Okay, so it's 1971. Uh, Ralph Nader is winning all sorts of victories, legislative victories in Congress. He's one of the most famous people uh, in America, one of the most respected people in America. Um, And Lewis Powell is the head of the American Bar Association and a tobacco industry lawyer, major corporate lawyer, like sort of imagine like a really establishment kind of guy. Uh, and he sees Ralph Nader in Fortune magazine, which is probably the business elite's favorite magazine. Mm-hmm. Sure. Kind of talking about how powerful Ralph Nader is. And he decides to write this memo for the Chamber of Commerce, which is the you know major business uh, lobby group in Washington. And it's this memo that lays out a blueprint for how corporate interests moneyed interests can and need to take over the government. Uh, that, that the idea, if you, I mean, if you can believe it, it sounds so absurd at this point, but that, you know, business is under attack. Business mm-hmm. is persecuted. Uh, businessmen, the corporations are the real victims in American society, uh, P- Powell argues. And here are the ways we have to fight back. Uh, one of the key things that he prescribes is a focus on the courts, on both um, stacking the courts with uh, more pro-business judges, but also then engineering cases that will uh, uh, prompt the courts to issue rulings that help corporate interests. Uh, so he writes this memo, uh, and there's been some debate recently, oh, you know, it was just the basically, you know... Uh, uh, a 1970s version of a of a Facebook post or a Reddit rant didn't really mean much. Well, actually, what we found is is that it meant a whole lot. The Chamber mm-hmm. of Commerce then uh, and a couple of other groups create Powell Memo Task Forces mm-hmm. uh, that are comprised of uh, top executives from m- the biggest of big and powerful corporations in America. Uh, you know, Phillips Petroleum, uh, ABC, CBS. Uh, just, you know, a who's who of power brokers in America. And they have a series of meetings about how they're going to implement the recommendations of the Powell Memo. Uh, One meeting, for instance, just to give folks a taste, one meeting is at Disney World, where uh, none other than... Of course uh, it's at Disney World. Of course, of course. course. Everything weird happens at Disney World. Uh, Where none other than, uh, at that point, um, House Minority Leader, a guy named Gerald Ford, is flown into the meeting uh, the meeting is focused in part on implementing the Powell memo and also on how to deal with the new campaign finance laws. Uh, and one of the documents we found says that they're focused on um, adding loopholes to this campaign finance law that's moving forward. And what do you know, eight months later or whatever, 10 months later, Gerald Ford is now president. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's after Watergate. Gerald Ford now has that campaign finance bill on his desk. Uh, and in within that bill are the loopholes that create the legal way for corporations to create 
what was called political action committees. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, there's an explosion of these uh, subsequently of political action committees to dump huge amounts of corporate money into politics, this time not illegal, like mm -hmm. in Watergate, but now fully legal. Uh, mm -hmm. And also out of out of this comes, speaking of the Powell memo's focus on lawsuits, comes a uh, creative uh, <clears throat> uh, lawsuit that was uh, designed to uh, kill almost completely uh, the campaign finance laws that passed out of water after Watergate. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a, a case masterminded by a guy named John Bolton. Now, if that name sounds familiar, yeah, it's the same John Bolton from the Iraq War, the same John Bolton right, from the with Bush the mustache, with like the walrus mustache, mustache right? guy, right. right? And what we what we found, by the way, is that there's a recurring cast of people that keep popping up that we 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 now start sort of call the master plan cinematic universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like Robert Bork is one of them. Robert Bork gets involved in this case, okay. And this case Wait, is designed before we run down that sure. that that road because Bork is fascinating, right? And and like the the thing that the case that you're building is really doing that, right? You're looking at all these characters, how they reappear in the echelons of power, and that we know the plan, which was laid out in this you know six thousand word document, um, it, is 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 their blueprint for all of the things that we've seen today and the sort of the dystopian situation. But I, I just want to reflect on one, one moment here, because we, we were talking about Lewis Powell, who was a board member on Philip Morris, right? Which at the DNC, Philip Morris was advertised there. But when he was uh, enshrined into the office, Philip Morris threw him a party and they gave him a literal justice robe with Philip Morris blanded on it like a race car. Like how much more literal can you get? And as a journalist, how enjoyable was that to see? Well, this was like kind of an urban legend that that this actually happened. So 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 Powell gets writes his memo and a few months later he gets a call from Richard Nixon, uh, Nixon telling him he's going to appoint him to the to the Supreme Court. Uh, and Powell's nomination, and some context here, Nixon's two previous uh, Supreme Court justices had been rejected by the Democratic Senate. Powell is seen as sort of a, um, uh, a moderate, moderate. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, s somebody who can, who, uh, as has been repeated by various folks uh, on the right, this, this notion of you need, to you need to be conservative enough to get nominated, but seem liberal enough. Right. And Powell sort of looked like this. Uh, he had a profile of this. Um, mm -hmm. He gets nominated. And uh, what we found uh, in some of the documents is that Powell has a, uh, is, is, uh, corresponds with J. Edgar Hoover throughout uh, in, in parts of the 60s oh, wow. and the early 70s. And when the FBI does its customary report to the Senate, to the senators evaluating the Powell nomination, what do you know? The FBI does not include any mention of the Powell memo uh, mm -hmm. at that point. Now, the Powell memo was not fully public. I mean, it's like circulating among business executives, chamber of mm -hmm. commerce types. Um, the FBI essentially omits it from its report. And Powell's nomination uh, passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you think about it, had, had the FBI put the Powell memo in the report, there's a good chance that the Democrats in the Senate would have rejected his nomination. And we can, we'll get to why him being put on the Supreme Court is so important. It comes a little bit mm -hmm. later. But so he gets confirmed. And right before he's headed to Washington, there was this urban legend that there was this party thrown for him and that there was a record or some kind of recording of this party thrown for him by Philip Morris on whose board uh, Powell had served. And so we're digging, I, I sort of said, I, I can't, I don't think this, we're never going to find this thing. It would be, be amazing to find it. There was like sort of a piece of a transcript that showed up somewhere, but no one had ever found the audio. Mm -hmm. And our producer, Jared Kang Mayer, ended up finding the actual physical vinyl record mm -hmm. and, uh, and the cover of the vinyl record. And you can hear excerpts of it. And on the cover, <clears throat> it shows Powell in a judicial robe in which the head of Philip Morris is giving him the robe and putting, you know, the robe has emblazoned on it, 
Philip Morris brands. And, uh, and, and here's another thing you talk about journalism. The other thing that's kind of incredible, this event is emceed by the CBS news anchor of the time, mm-hmm. Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite. Right. He, and Walter mm-hmm. Cronkite does a send up, a sort of mock version of Walter Cronkite's weekly show at that, at that time called You Are There. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's a, it's a You Are There send up of Lewis Powell's life. So the point of this story is like, is just to give you a sense of how embedded in the corporate yeah. elite this nominee was and how kind of explicit the politics of the moment were when it came mm-hmm. to that corporate power. Remember, this is the, the remember th- this is like the period of time when the tobacco industry is trying to fight off public health advocates and regulations. Right. Lewis Powell was involved in in helping the mm-hmm. tobacco industry do that. So that's who was put on the Supreme Court even though he he seemed and was portrayed as and billed as a kind of moderate, genteel, you know, sort of non-ideological, apolitical nominee. He was highly political uh, and certainly highly corporate. So uh, now a word from our sponsors, which is you. I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Uh, This sort of work is incredibly hard, whether it's my hard-hitting investigative journalism or interviews with really amazing thinkers. It means the world to me that you are watching this. And there's a couple things you can do to support my work. There's obviously the algorithm part of things where you can hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. Uh, That helps the algorithm, you know, spread this around to people. But more importantly, I just want you to know that I have this Substack newsletter, uh, which is where the main support for my channel actually comes from. And I would love you to get early access to my work and be part of that community so that I can keep going up against really, really powerful players with just truth on my side. So consider doing that and consider getting my newsletter where you can see, you know, my thoughts as we go forward. And without further ado, back to our program. It's so nice that you point uh, toward Jared's work, right? Um, You know, because you involved, like, this was not just a David Sirota podcast. And, you know, for for full um, for full uh, disclosure, uh, my wife Laura Krantz, who's also a podcaster, it was one of the people who worked on your show. But there was a whole amazing team here. What were some of the other like never be- before heard or seen things that you ended up finding in your national search of archives and and interviews? Well, we found the, the the documents about the the meeting at Disney World where Gerald Ford was there. Uh, we found um, a document at, at another Powell memo focused meeting where Roger Ailes made a presentation. Roger Ailes, you know, Fox News founder, mm-hmm. actually was a Nixon campaign aide. Roger Ailes made a presentation to corporate executives, uh, urging them to consider using their power as advertisers on mm-hmm. television to sway television programming. Uh, to make mm-hmm. it more pro business, to uh, uh, to to make it more pro free market. So, <laughs> you know, there's this whole like, oh, you know, people hear, uh, you know, every time it's mentioned that, hey, maybe corporate media is somewhat influenced by corporate advertisers. Mm-hmm. You get a lot of eye rolls. Oh, it's just a conspiracy theory. Well, he- here's Roger Ailes literally making this presentation. Mm-hmm. to the assembled corporate executives uh uh being like pay me to influence politics <laughs> like straight up yeah or or use your position if you're advertising on the cbs nightly news mm-hmm. uh you the tobacco you know this or that company you should call up cbs news and pressure them to uh have your broadcast be more corporate more pro-corporate mm-hmm. Uh, with the implied threat that you're an advertiser and you'll take your business somewhere else, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so th- what's incredible is how much of this stuff they wrote down, right? They they mm-hmm. wrote it down, um, and, and then and then of course um, there's all the uh, backroom machinations at the Supreme Court itself. Well, we mm-hmm. talked about this Buckley case uh, in which uh, John Bolton mm-hmm. masterminded this idea previously a radical kind of fringe idea that money in politics isn't corruption. Money in politics is constitutionally protected speech. Uh, Right. And, and John Bolton is the lawyer, one of the lawyers Mm -hmm. in that case and gets the Supreme court to enshrine that idea in the law, which is the building block of every other 
uh, campaign finance ruling, really the building block of of the era of corruption we live in, that you can't regulate political money because political money mm-hmm. is constitutionally protected speech. Behind the scenes at the Supreme Court, right after that, there was another case that came up soon after uh, in which uh, Laura Krantz uh, re- reported on this and dug this all up, which is that uh, Lewis Powell works behind the scenes, and you can see it in memos and sort of drafts of, of, of his writings, to take this obscure case, it was out of a case out of Massachusetts, and not only get a ruling to further deregulate campaign finance, but to make it a broad ruling. To, mm-hmm. Instead of making it a narrow ruling just on what was happening in Massachusetts on a specific ballot measure, is to issue a broad ruling effectively extending those uh, money is free speech rights to corporations, Mm -hmm. giving them the constitutionally protected right to spend in elections. And that ruling becomes the foundation and the reference points all over uh, the Citizens United case uh, Mm -hmm. a couple decades later. So the discovery of how these rulings were engineered. And in that case, Mm -hmm. the guy who literally wrote the Powell memo being the guy who literally then is in a position to engineer one of the foundational rulings to legalize corruption. I mean, it's almost like they had a master plan. This uh, ruling, which I think that's Buckley v. Vallejo. Money is is speech is Buckley v. Vallejo. Corporations have free speech rights uh, to spend money in elections. That's called Bilotti. And, and it's so interesting in the plan, you know, you, you, you start by, you start talking about um, how uh, Lewis Powell really didn't like Ralph Nader, right? And, and that, but they, and Ralph Nader was trying to rabble rouse, trying to get safety, trying to get regulations. And what's so fascinating in the threads that you're pulling is that, that this sort of corrupt cabal is using the same language and tactics as Nader and as, as these sort of liberal people to sort of bastardize it and corrupt their own thought processes in order to pursue this sort of moneyed agenda. Oh, that was central. That was actually explicit. Um, that 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 the Powell memo is basically um, saying at some points uh, that they should take a page out of what Nader was doing then. And I think specifically what they were talking about is part of Nader's formula was we are going to file lawsuits uh, to try to get the courts to to elicit rulings from the courts, um, creating new rights, uh, fortifying uh, new regulations. And what the Powell memo was focused on was, hey, we, the conservative movement, can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They essentially said, you know, Nader um, portrays his uh, legal groups as public interest legal groups, Mm -hmm. but we can make a challenge for what is in the public interest. We can create our own, Nader had public citizen, for instance. Mm -hmm. Uh, The conservative movement creates groups like the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, These, and there's a couple of them regionally. What they basically are, 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 I, they're called, quote, public interest law firms. They file uh, cases on behalf of the public. But what they really are is private interest law firms mm-hmm. filing lawsuits to try to get the courts to 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 deliver rulings that corporations yeah, like, want. Right. I mean, it's the same sort of like broken logic that gets you like a, a cake person in Southern Colorado, exactly. you know, exactly. a, a baker who sort of invents the, maybe a gay person would want me to make their wedding cake. And somehow that becomes the basis for taking away um, gay rights at, at the Supreme Court. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward to like Citizens United. I mean, one of the, mm-hmm. the things we're, we're, we report in that episode, which is coming up soon is, you know, it was, we can get into the details, but it was about a, a movie about Hillary Clinton and whether the movie violated um, uh, hmm. the federal election campaign laws. Was it really a movie or was it a glorified political ad? And the interesting thing is, is that that case was essentially manufactured. It's not like the federal election regulators knocked down the door of the creators of the movie and said, you can't do this. What ended up actually happening was is that the creators of the movie went to the regulators and kind of provoked them, said, hey, if we do this, 
what you know would you do you think it violates uh the the laws do you think it's a, it's an ad uh and the the agency essentially said, yeah, it probably parts of it probably do violate the letter and the spirit of the of the law in the sense of it being able to be regulated and you have to disclose your donors. The point being is they so they, they manufactured the case, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. the manufacturing of the case to elicit a ruling is essentially like using the courts as a super legislature, right? The courts are supposed to be arbitrating what the legislature passes, right? The legislature mm-hmm. passes a law and then the courts basically arbitrate whether uh, something happened, didn't happen, uh, whether that violated that law or whether the law itself violates the constitution. What the right has really done is turned um, the courts into a super legislature that makes the law. That's mm-hmm. why they've been so focused on the courts. Now, the thing is, what's so dangerous about that is that it's one thing for the Congress or a state legislature to make a law that's super extreme uh, and bad. The the democratic system that's supposed to exist as a check on that is that those legislators can be voted out of office in two or four years right. and the law can be changed. The problem with using the courts as a super legislature is the mm-hmm. courts can issue a ruling making new law mm-hmm. and the public cannot vote out the judges. Mm -hmm. The the, the judges are installed for life. And I think one of the the revelations that Lewis Powell had baked into his memo is that if we can take over this this one branch of government, in particular, the court system with lifetime appointments, then we have to worry a lot less about the other branches of government because this one branch of government is is far more permanent Mm -hmm. uh, on a personnel uh, personnel wise than any of the other branches. So if we can get the judiciary to be a super legislature, we have to worry a lot less about Congress or even the president. Yeah, I mean, the entire concept of checks and balances um, fails when one entire branch can no longer, you know, is is immune to the checks and balances of the other two branches. And this is regardless of of political party. That's an apolitical statement. Like the, the, the very organization seems like it has problems. I, I want to I, we can go into the Supreme Court forever, and like we, I don't think we need to. I think people have opinions on the Supreme Court that are, you know, well established at this point. I want to go back to something that you'd said earlier, and it's something that I've personally always had, like recently had trouble accepting. It's the line that money controls everything in politics, and you know, I the reason I don't always believe this is is looking at 2016 with the rise of Donald Trump, who has, is this giant charismatic, you know, probably maybe almost billionaire person. But in that moment, in 2016, Jeb Bush had this enormous war chest of money. You know, just just all of the money was in Jeb Bush's coffers. And it, it was I, I, I probably dozens of times larger than what Trump's war chest was. But in the end, he got basically no traction at the RNC uh, and the media anointed Trump probably because of his, whatever his unique charisma is. So that to me undermines this whole like sort of Noam Chomsky manufacturing a, a consent sort of thing here, like that, that, the, that the money is controlling everything when actually there's these other factors that are involved. Do you think that Trump is unique in this? Do you think he's a deviation from this master plan? Or is it sort of an aberration that has risen to embrace it? I think money, ultimately, why is money so powerful in in politics? I think, and especially elections, there's two ways money is powerful in politics. One, the promise of of enriching, personally enriching politicians. If you vote this way when you're in the Senate, when Senate, when you get out of the Senate, you'll be able to, we'll hire you for a job. We'll make you a, you know, a million dollar a year lobbyist. Uh, that's an obvious way money corrupts and 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 is determines political outcomes. I think the other way money determines political outcomes, pro- probably more more obviously in elections, is money allows uh, politicians to communicate their message to the most amount of voters and drown out those without money. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, if you have an election with two candidates, candidate A, candidate B, and candidate A has sent you ten pieces of mail. Uh, 15 text messages, their lawn signs are everywhere, they're on television, and candidate B, you've barely seen, you're pretty likely to vote for candidate A. 
because you don't even know who candidate B is. Right. And candidate A is able to do that because candidate A has the most money. So I think where that breaks down, and, and it's it's a, it's a, an anomaly where it breaks down, but it can break down when if candidate B is a celebrity, mm-hmm. right? If candidate A has all the money and candidate B is a celebrity who is inherently going to get media attention, uh, who is inherently already well known to the public, then candidate B can win. But I think that anomaly, certainly Donald Trump was super famous. And, you know, I mean, that's not the norm. I, I, I certainly grant you that that can happen, but it's not the norm. And, and I think corruption becomes, in some ways, more um, uh, politically determinative further down the ballot than the presidential level. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, the presidential nominees uh, are inherently become celebrities. Everybody ends up knowing exactly who they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you can make an argument that at the at the very, very top, the presidential level, uh, once you have nominees, that money may not be completely determinative of outcomes. Uh, mm-hmm. I would, I would, I would, but I would also say that who becomes the nominees, money can be determinative. Who has yeah, the, I, like George W. Bush in two thousand? Mm-hmm. There were twenty other candidates running in the Republican primary. George mm-hmm. W. Bush had all the money; he won, mm-hmm. right? So, I, but but I think it gets uh, like way more exaggerated, you know, in Senate races or in the local U.S. House races, right? I mean, sure. this is why the candidates with the most money go one level down the ballot where n- none of the candidates are typically celebrities. Uh, the, right. pu- the, the public barely knows who these people are. The media barely covers it. So who typically wins are the candidates who have enough money to independently mm-hmm. communicate with voters, uh, not through uh, you know local media coverage, but with through just television ads. It's, it's great that you bring up the down ballot stuff because that is where most of our democracy actually functions, and sometimes even sometimes it even functions well down ballot because they're not is so, there's not so much scrutiny, and yet we do see people like you know Ronald Reagan and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura. I, I believe that Andrew Huberman is now aiming for a governorship in you know the, the next election cycle in California. I mean, I think that we see these celebrities um, having a parallel track, but money is definitely great, right? Money does does do something um you know in i'm not sure this is directly related to that um but you know one of the outcomes of all of this money in politics money being speech has been the rise of super PACs and and these these sort of conglomerations of money that funnel into politics and you know when i look at the that american political donations and and the current system that we have right? It's sort of open to public scrutiny. Any individual who gives over $200 is easily searchable and identified on opensecrets.org. And you know, any of you can go look at that right now. In fact, right before this podcast, I did when I put in the name David Sirota into the database <laughs> and I come up with a total of $5,098 going back to 92 in political donations. But I'm guessing that they're not all you. <laughs> I'm thinking there's just I, I definitely David don't think I've made... <laughs> five thousand dollars i like uh, no no i don't think it's all you i think these are other david sirotas as well yeah i mean I, you know. <laughs> yeah i i well, rarely ever make a political donation political donation uh i i certainly um i'm happy to make donations to my wife that i'm happy that, to do. that's true and uh, who is a, a representative here in 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 denver uh, yeah. in colorado um but you know this i did the same search for scott carney and apparently I've given, you know, Scott Carney's have given $8,320 in the same period, but none of which I remember giving. So there's actually a bunch of, of Scott Carney's out there giving money, just like there's a lot of David Soros. But the larger point here is that individuals who donate money are tracked and it's open to public scrutiny, but it's not so with corporations. It's not so with super PACs and, where who can give almost unlimited amounts of money. Tell me how this dystopian reality came about. It's a, it's a great question. And by the way, I'm looking up my, my donations here. Almost all of these are not my donations. Uh, <laughs> just, just to be clear, I'm looking here. I think the biggest donation I gave that, it, that is actually me, there's some, some guy in New York uh, with my same name. I think the biggest donation I gave is um, uh, $50. 
I think that's the biggest donation I gave. Don't quote me on that, but I'm just I'm just looking here. Well, anyway. I gave a hundred dollars in the current uh, in the current election, and I and then I got in, flooded with text messages. And no, I'm, I'm like, sure. God, why did I give a donation? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> but, sure. <yes. laughs> I'm sure. I'm um, sure. Look, I think you know the really big money in politics is flowing through dark money organizations where uh, the money is not disclosed at all. Uh, and, and I think that's, this is part of the master plan, right? I mean, the first step in the master plan is um, equate money in politics, not to corruption, but to constitutionally protected speech. That opens the door for unlimited amounts of money. The second step, the Bilotti case, uh, give corporations the right those free speech rights uh, to spend in an unlimited way uh, on um, on elections and politics. The, the next step is um, allow corporations to deliver unlimited amounts of money uh, to the political parties, uh, uh, and that happened in the in the uh, 80s and into the 90s. And then the next step is allow corporations and billionaires uh, to to spend money on elections without disclosing their who they are, what interests they represent. Uh, and that ultimately culminates, obviously, in, in Citizens United. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what we're talking about here are the, the rise of, of what's known as 501c4 groups. Mm -hmm. These are supposed to be social welfare organizations, essentially charities, really. Uh, uh, that's what they're determined to be under the under the tax code. Mm -hmm. There was a one word change in the tax code in the mid 1950s, which base which said essentially it used to be that these organizations, in order to be organized like this, uh, had to um, uh, have all of their uh, uh, their operations uh, be focused on essentially public education, charitable works. Uh, and they changed that to be a standard of uh, something to the effect of most of. Uh, oh, wow. Their, their, and what that said is that created the space for them to use more and more of their resources mm -hmm. to spend on politics and electioneering. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and so more and more money has gone into these 501c4 groups, which crucially do not have to d disclose who their donors are even though they are spending money to sway elections and influence mm -hmm. politics. So this is why you see these ads, you know, it's like Americans for good, for a good America, right? They, they just, you don't even know who they are. They're blanketing right. your television with, with ads saying this Senator is great. And this Senator is terrible. You have no idea who's even talking to mm -hmm. you. Uh, and this is a radical notion. I mean, so radical that um, uh, even in the citizens United ruling, the ruling says, look, the government does have a right to force disclosure of this. Mm -hmm. Even Justice Antonin Scalia in a separate case said democracy essentially relies on us. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to have unlimited spending, if we're going to let corporations and billionaires spend as much as they want on politics, mm -hmm. because that you can't regulate or limit so-called free speech if money is speech. We should at least be able to know who's talking to us. Uh, yeah. Is it speech if you can't hear it? Like like the whole idea that this is speech. And now if it's hidden, it's not really speech. It, anymore. It's spe it's it, the I think the metaphor is it's definitely speech because we can all hear it. It's just we don't even know who's talking. Right. Mm -hmm. Like like mm -hmm. so. So. The, the Congress. And state legislatures could presumably deal with this. And some state legislatures have by saying. Look, if you're a 501c4 organization, you have to at least disclose your donors. They they can do that right now, but of course, the re mostly the Republicans in Congress are the ones who are blocking that, and that's part of the master plan. They use the filibuster to block what's known as the Disclose Act, uh, mm. to 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 prevent mandated disclosure of this. And to be clear, even though the Citizens United case said this disclosure is allowed, the court subsequently, uh, big shocker, the Supreme Court can lie. Uh, the, the Supreme Court subsequently limited uh, some forms of disclosure. And in, the, in, in, a, in a concurrence in the Citizens United case, actually, um, uh, Clarence Thomas lays out an argument for why there shouldn't be any disclosure, uh, mandated disclosure at all. Oh, so Clarence wow. Thomas envisions a world in which there's not only unlimited corporate spending, but 
we the public to. have no right to know ever who's That's who's cool. speaking and, and, you know it's also it's interesting there's this collision especially recently um where where with, with techno bureaucrats coming out you know with with bitcoin and cryptocurrency that is entering the election you know citizens.org uh, put out a report this year that said 119 million dollars has been donated into the current election cycle on both in to both parties right it, and you know, meanwhile, crypto corporations, I don't even know what a crypto corporation is, has donated an additional $224 million in this election cycle. Meanwhile, both Donald Trump and RFK Jr. spoke at the Bitcoin conference this, uh, I think it was in July, but it might have been in August. You know, it, it, and that is is algorithmically protected from identities. It seems like we're getting to this point where, you know, Clarence Thomas goes out there and says, hey, you know, you know, maybe we don't have to disclose, but now it's almost being locked into the very uh, fiber of, the, of these transactions. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's ultimately the vision that billionaires and corporations uh, get to spend in an unlimited way to hijack the political discourse, hijack uh, elections without ever having to face any accountability, without ever allowing us to know uh, who is actually doing the swing. I mean, this is the ultimate man behind the curtain. That's the ultimate mm -hmm. vision. And it's a pretty dystopian vision. Uh, and, it does, and the thing is, I keep going back to it, it doesn't have to be this way. Even if mm -hmm. we never repeal Citizens United, mm -hmm. under the Citizens United paradigm, disclosure is permissible, re required disclosure, mandated mm -hmm. disclosure. And yet we still don't have that. And, and, and so we are living in a world where these elections are being bought and, and sold by forces who remain largely in the dark. I mean, we can, we can assume who they are, we can presume who they are, but we don't actually know. Does any of this extend to the regular human? You know, the whole idea that money is speech, right? Which it seems like it's, it's, it's created to, to create this political structure. But is there any way that this also helps or, or alters the interactions that ordinary people have? Like when you spend money somewhere, is that considered speech? Would it be legal to, I don't know, blackmail someone? For instance, if you were uh, you know, releasing a podcast a, 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 about Philip Morris, and instead of releasing it, you went to them and say, well, you know, I don't need to release this podcast if you give if you speak to me and give me money, would that be legal or is that, is that is this how 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 far does this go? I mean, it's a it's a great question, and I don't I don't know how far it goes. I don't think we we know how far it goes. I, I think, look, I think there's an a how to draw the lines on what political speech is, how to regulate it, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that is a valid debate, right? I I, I do think these are real constitutional questions mm -hmm. uh, about how to you know. What is a political ad? What is electioneering? Can it be regulated? I, I think these are legitimate questions. But I also think that there are ways to combat this that don't have to deal with these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the real short, short or medium term solution to some of this is public financing of elections. At yeah. the core, Mm -hmm. We now have a privately financed election system, right? Where mm -hmm. if you want to run for office, you effectively to have enough resources to run, you have to go to private donors, private interests, some call it special interests, ask them for money. And the mm -hmm. largest sums of those money uh, typically comes from interests that want government favors. I mean, right. yes, Every now and again, there's a campaign that's funded by millions and millions of small dollar donors. Mm -hmm. but, but those are typically presidential campaigns where the candidates are very famous, very well known. If you're right. running for state legislature, you're not going to be, you're typically not going to be a celebrity who can find a national network of $50 donors to give right. you, uh, you know, enough money to run a, 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 the kind of race you need to, to, to run with enough resources. So oftentimes you're going to have to go to interests that have, who are going to want something from you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you fix that? You create a publicly financed system, which says if you raise enough small dollar donations, a certain threshold of credibility and legitimacy to prove that you have support in your community, 
-hmm. then the government uh, puts in money for you to be able to run your race in a way that's well-funded so that you answer not to private interests, you answer to the public interest. Now, some would say, oh, this is a, a proposal to you know, give away to politicians. We're just going to give more taxpayer dollars to politicians. Mm -hmm. Well, the current government is what private interests buy. Do you like mm -hmm. the current government? You, mm -hmm. you think that's a, like the, the current government is the best government private billionaire and corporate money can buy. Not so good, is it? Not so mm -hmm. good, right? Publicly financed in, uh, elections is a way for the public to invest in its own election system, invest in getting a government that isn't the best government that private money can mm -hmm. buy. It's It gives us people a way to run for office who don't have to answer to special interests, corporate interests, mm -hmm. and billionaires. And the thing is, it's not a crazy idea. Some states right. have done it. Some cities have done it. Some uh, countries it passed, have done it. it. Some countries have done it. It's passed the U.S. Senate twice mm -hmm. uh, after Watergate. It passed Congress uh, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, after corruption scandals then, it was vetoed. Point being, this is not an insane idea. This is not like some crazy idea. This is kind of, to my mind, the most minimal thing a civilized society should do uh, in order to make sure it doesn't have effectively a private interest government operating in the people's name. Yeah, and and like our two party system. I mean, it seems like public money for elections. That, you know, I, I'm going to admit something to you, which is highly embarrassing for me. But you know, it's a <laughs> podcast, so let's maybe, maybe people haven't gotten this far to it. Turn it off. Turn off the podcast if you don't want to hear something embarrassing. So in 2000, Ralph Nader is running for for president, and I was refreshed out of college, and I loved his message. Right? I loved Nader's message. And I contributed to his campaign. And, and, and one of his things that was so big is like, hey, I'm not going to win this election. I know I'm not going to win this. But if I get to 5% threshold of a popular vote, they give more money to the Green Party. And the Green Party will then have the ability to get some sort of public financing. I was like, hey, that's cool. I'm going to do this. And I voted for Nader. And I you know, encouraged my friends to vote for Nader. Luckily, I wasn't in Florida, which is where the whole election um, flipped on. But you know, our the entire system is so unbelievably rigged with this master plan, with this two-party system. Like I don't know many listeners out there who are like, I am a tried and true X party or Y party, and everything they say fits my soul. It's like I, I feel stuck as a voter. And I and I, I from a perusal of your um, your social media, which is no, quite riotous and fun, and everyone should subscribe to David Sirota. I feel like you're very frustrated with the political system as well. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, look, I, I I've said this before. I'll say it again. I think that working out that, that there's an argument to work outside the two party system. There's an argument to work that people's work is needed outside the the uh, uh, election system. That we see politics too much as just elections and not. Uh, organizing in the workplace or uh, all kinds of other other ways to to change policy and to change society. Um, I think there are good people who are working, uh, trying to work inside of uh, uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, I don't think anybody has a monopoly on what is a good and valid tactic to get a better government and a better society. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think, and I think there's arguments all the way around. I mean, I look at the fact that the center of the Democratic Party has clearly moved on major mm -hmm. economic issues, to my mind, in a better direction. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got the American Rescue Plan was a huge investment in the working class of this country. It shouldn't have expired, but it was certainly the biggest investment in the working class of this country, uh, just on the dollars and cents of it. Um, uh, in my lifetime, uh, the FTC, what it's done, the CFPB, what it's done, the the Department of Labor, uh, uh, be, uh, in terms of union stuff. I mean, I think that that I had worried that the Biden administration was going to retrench back to the Obama administration and the Clinton mm -hmm. administration. You know, I mean, Clinton you know, welfare cuts, uh, the era of big government is over. Uh, Barack Obama, as I did, as we explored in, in Meltdown, our other podcast. Uh, Barack Obama bailed out the banks while 10 million people got, oh, got foreclosed on. Uh, it was did, crazy. Like that, Meltdown was a great podcast. Like I know we're you. talking about Master Plan, but I really love Meltdown. And yeah, just to just to see 
the way the Obama administration worked, like I generally liked Obama. I thought Obama was a generally decent president. I don't have high expectations for most presidents, but like hearing the way that involved and, and, and the complicity in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, letting the banks thrive despite making thousands and thousands of people bankrupt and making, you know, having all these foreclosures, it was shocking to me. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think the point is, is that the Biden administration, to my mind, has been substantially better on economic policy. And it's because there's been a lot of work done inside of the party to shift the center of the party mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to make it an imperative for a leader of the party to be better. My, so the point being that I think w whether you're working inside of the two-party system, outside of the two-party system, uh, outside of electoral politics, clearly what we're getting from the government uh, overall, what we're, the way our society is now structured, isn't working for lots and lots of people. And I go back to this, you know, this, this notion that, uh, that some elite pundits were confused about recently, where... Uh, the macroeconomic numbers have been decent, uh, but people in polls are expressing frustration with the economy. And there's been some confusion about, well, why, how could the macro economy be doing better, better but people are mad uh, at, mm -hmm. the, at, at the economy? And maybe this is just people are, you know, Americans are stupid or, or uh, Americans are just, uh, you, know, you know, can be misled. I think, no, that, that, the, the obvious answer is this. The macro economy can be doing well, but people's lived experience can be getting worse because the structure of the economy has been rigged. The structure right. of the economy has been rigged that when the economy is humming along and doing well, more and more wealth goes up this up the income scale, mm -hmm. and it doesn't improve the lives of everyone else. Uh, and it, until you deal with the structure of the economy, uh, that same dynamic is going to happen. The, you know, the GDP mm -hmm. growth could be great, but people, uh, their lived experience is getting worse. And and I think that is the result ultimately of a master plan to legalize corruption. The way the econ the laws are put in place and the, the, the society was restructured so that rising tides don't lift all boats comes from a series of legislative decisions about how we structure the economy. And those legislative decisions are in part influenced by the fact that the system that makes the legislation is dominated by a handful of people with lots of money who now are allowed to buy elections, legislation, and court rulings. How do we get out of it? Well, we just talked about public financing of elections. As well. I mean, there's no one so way. What about the, what about the, or is there anything an ordinary citizen can do? Or is the, is the only solution the, the, the just vote? Uh, no, I don't think it's just vote. I think it's, I think it's, First of all, get involved in, you know, if you want to talk about the election space, uh, run for office, run for a mm. small office, run for mm -hmm. a local office, uh, support people, be attuned to do organizing around not just the presidential race. Like, I bet there are a lot of people listening to this who know lots and lots of details about what's going on in the Kamala Harris Donald Trump election, but don't even know who their city council person is or who their state legislator is, right? Like that's part of the problem here. Okay. That, so get focused on the arenas that you can have more impact, right? It's the old idea that, you know, uh, and I'm butchering the quote, but a, a, a small number of people can have a huge amount of impact, uh, a small number of organized people. So pick the arenas where you can have a bigger impact. Uh, I, I would, I would say, um, you know, focus on following through with pressure on your elected officials when they get into office. Uh, I, I would also say this. The flip side is don't and this is a psychological issue, but I think we're edge. We're close to or, or there's a danger of edging over into the system is so corrupt. It can never be fixed. And in fact, it's not even corrupt. Corruption is now just what politics is. Uh, corruption is so normalized uh, that it's 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 what politics has become. And I think the danger of that is obvious. And, and the example of that is, let me give you two examples. In 2020, uh, Zephyr Teachout, who was a supporter of Bernie Sanders, she's a law professor, anti-corruption advocate. She wrote an op-ed uh, when Bernie Sanders was running for uh, president in the primary against Joe Biden. She wrote an op-ed about Joe Biden's all too close relationship with his corporate donors, credit card donors, et cetera, et cetera. And the, she sort of said Joe Biden has a corruption problem. And 
The backlash to that op-ed was so severe that Bernie Sanders felt the need to publicly apologize to Joe Biden. Uh, In this year, this year's election, Katie Porter, Congresswoman, ran for Senate in California. Crypto billionaires dumped a huge amount of money into her primary in order to try to defeat her. And they did defeat her. And after the election, uh, she said, yeah, elections can be rigged by billionaires spending millions of dollars. And she was vilified. Uh, you know, now there was some of that was, you know, oh, Don, when now we hear the word rig and like Donald, you know, it means she's denying the election results. She wasn't saying that, but she she felt the need. She felt pressured to to apologize. And the takeaway for me on all of that is, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're move, we're edging into a situation where it's like the David Foster Wallace speech about the, the fish. There are two fish sitting there. Another another fish swims by. And says, hey, how's the water today? And one of the fish turns to the other and says, what's water? I feel like that's what's happening with corruption, that it's so we're so immersed in it. It's so pervasive that 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 lots of people don't even recognize that it's unacceptable, outrageous, artificial and wrong. Uh, And that and that now the people who call it out are the ones who are looked at as the problem. Right. Like Bernie Sanders has to apologize. Katie Porter has to apologize for calling it out. And, and that is the ultimate final step, to my mind, of the master plan, to normalize it at a psychological level, where it becomes the matrix, to use a, another overused metaphor, where it's just, we don't even recognize it. And anybody saying that, that what we're immersed in is wrong, they're the problem, not the corruption itself. Uh, that was such a brilliant end moment for this podcast. So I think we're going to leave it there. And I want everyone to go check out Master Plan. It is currently topping the charts. I think two days ago, it was number 20 on Apple Podcasts. I would love to see this go up into the top 10 because this is the sort of stuff that we need to talk about. And it's very well produced. It sounds awesome. Like there's all these different voices. There's a really good score, a kick-ass theme song. And and just go like and subscribe to that, to this channel, all the things that people do. And thank you so much for being here. Oh, and check out David's The Lever News as well. Um, it is, you know, if you liked what he was saying here, this sort of like fresh take on politics, this independent line, go check that out. That's the news site that he runs. Uh, and if you want a good movie, go watch Don't Look Up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much, David. And uh, from Pokey Bear LLC in Denver, Colorado, this was Scott Carney Investigates. Thank you so much to all of my supporters on Patreon and on Substack who make this work possible. If you want early access and get your name on the honor roll, uh, please check out those links down below. And you know, it just means the world to me that you're here. From Pokey Bear LLC in Denver, Colorado, this was Scott Carney Investigates. Mm-hmm. <laughs>